Well, hello, you comic book lovers out there. This is Hellermouse trying a new format. I'll try to be quick here because basically you can go back and read this article yourself. It's right there in front of you. It's from 1990. You guys who have uh, stuck around for quite a while and you people who are new and relatively new sort of know that I'm more into comic book history, not just in the comics, but outside of the comics. And this, this is an article that I just find absolutely uh, fantastic because I think a lot of what's lost in comics uh, in the last, uh, I don't know, 10 years maybe, I mean, if I really thought about it, maybe I could zone it in a little bit more and stuff, is that we've forgotten that comic books, uh, one of the things that strive to be, whether knowing or unknowingly, was to be accepted as an art form. Um, I see a lot of people talking about a lot of things that like comic books have always been political. They weren't. And that comics were always this and comics were always that. And nothing in comic book history, unless you cherry pick, uh, really, really reflects what the narrative is today that has so many pros and uh, comic fans going to add it to each other on, on Twitter and stuff at the time of this recording. Um, and I do point that out because I really, as you'll see in this, I believe history repeats itself and who knows how long this is going to last and stuff, right? But anyway, um, this is a fantastic, um, interview with Art Spiegelman, the person who wrote and drew Mouse, Moss, however you want to, however, you know, tomato, tomato, uh, but with, it's one of the uh, it's one of the triple threat books of the '80s that really elevated comics to be being accepted. But things were going on way before then. Um, so basically, at the uh, art Insti at a school of the Art Institute uh, in I'm assuming Chicago here, I'm not sure. But uh, Art Spiegelman was 42 in 1990, and this is the kind of stuff that I grew up on. I read articles, uh, you know, here and there, putting you know, I was piecing together comic book history from different uh, sources uh, as I collected over the years. Sort of had a, a picture out there. And I did a video years ago, uh, you know, about cookie dough and talking about the comic book community for what it was and what comics were uh, to me. But anyway, at the time of this, uh, Spiegelman was uh, 42. Uh, as you can see here in the article, he'd been praised for its, you know, his work has been praised for its power and originality. originality. And... Um, as we go on down here, um, he kind of explains exactly how people who worked in comics were seen in America versus Europe. Right there he says, uh, cartoonists are seen by the mainstream art world as being somewhere between a sign painter and a plumber. Uh, in Europe, they're one rung below movie directors, which was amazing uh, f to see some, you know, someone actually acknowledge this um, because heavy metal... And the 70s brought a lot of that European art over here. And the most prominent that I can think of is, of course, Mobius. Uh, so in Europe, um, I don't know, 18 years ago maybe, I had a co-worker actually go to England and Paris. And while they were over there in Paris, they they brought me a, a, a graphic novel by Tardy. It's in, it's in French, of course. I can tell it was crime noir. And uh, I could still follow or come up with the story just by the panels, even though it was in French. But the interesting story that I got from this co-worker was when she was thinking about me. Um, I knew she and her husband ate dinner at their house many times. They were looking for the comics and thought it was going to be like in, in America, where you know it was going to be stuck in a corner somewhere on a magazine rack. And then, and, and then all of a sudden, they said they started noticing a lot of businessmen wearing black trench coats and things. This is in Paris. And it was prominent businessmen sitting there reading these books, and that's how they were able to find them. So right there, right off the bat, right there, uh, it was always something that comic book uh, people in the comic book world, from what I read over the years, would lie about what their job was. They would not admit to living comics. And we'll, he touches on why that was here in a minute. Um, we talk about Mouse. Um, and, and, and it really elevated the, the medium of comics into an art form um, with the sophistication and the uh, subject matter of what he did. He was t retelling the stories of his parents as uh, Polish Jews in Eastern Europe in the 30s and 40s, their survival of the Holocaust, and his mother's suicide. He did this, uh, you know, over a few years, and... 
Um, the subject matter was pretty new back then, and Spiegelman moved further into the unorthodox terrain by drawing Jews as mice, Germans as cats, Poles as pig, and Americans as dogs. Um, the, the lecture goes on. They talk a lot about his lecture, but he actually was able to show a presentation during this of cartoons and illustrations going back to the 1840s. Now, a lot of people kind of assume comics kind of started in the 30s. Some people go with, um, you know, first appearance of Superman in 1938. People also go to the comic strips and, uh, you know, the pulp novels of the 20s, uh, like um, Gladiator and things like that. But he goes way back, and this is an interesting read. And um, what, what he also pointed out was the focus of the effort to clean up comic books in the 1950s that was spurred by Seduction of the Innocent, a best-selling book written by Frederick Wortham, a psychiatrist who believed their stories corrupted the young. And I know a little bit about the backstory about what led up to Frederick Wortham um, kind of being involved in this and how it made it all the way to uh, pretty much having government hearings and things uh, about comic books. It all kind of started in the late 40s when a senator's wife was at a garden party and she found some comics, uh, a, a comic stuck in the back of uh, her son's uh, back pocket, rolled up and stuff, and thought it was just, you know, awful. Now, I've heard that was the late 40s, early 50s, but that's what I'm trying to say. There's a lot more behind it that read, led up to this. Very much reminds me of the uh, Tipper Gore trials on music uh, hearings in the 80s where we had, um, you know, we had Dee Snyder, Twisted Sister, standing right there with... Um, Oh my, uh, John Denver uh, talking about freedom of speech. They ended up putting labels, uh, warnings on music CDs, and the sales in those CDs went up. Um, if you want to really see a great video that embraced this, and they put that label all over the video in their stage, I think it's a song by Jacko called Down On Me or something like that. They had that uh, warning all over the video and stuff. They just embraced it. Anyway... That's why I'm saying that history does repeat itself one form or the other. So anyway, the campaign was fierce and uh, hysterical uh, during the McCarthy fever of the times. Uh, there were PTA boycotts at bookstores during the 50s of comic books, uh, congressional hearings that led to a self-regulating code by comic book publishers. The code was very stringent. And it was that uh, characters shouldn't be shown smoking. You couldn't use words like zombie, evil must never win over bad, and there was all sorts of things. So basically, anything you found in an EC comic is basically what the rules are made out of. You know, and this is, these are the people that did things like Tales from the Crypt. Um, the, eff the effort was to stifle creativity in a craft that has always had something of an identity problem. Uh, speaking one first to spell comics as comics with an X to uh, connect the mixing of words and pictures and distinguish the serious genre from the funny ha-ha strips, right? Which goes back to comics have not always been political, you know? <laughs> you know, it's, it's like this is not news. This is why the current comic book environment just blows my mind and how I know that a lot of people are just jumping in um, in the fight. I don't know what we would call it. Um, just don't know what they're talking about. They're picking and choosing, and there's a bigger picture going on here. It's not about comics. Um, so he ends up talking about Mad Magazine and Harvey Kurtzman, who he considers the father of underground comics. Harvey Kurtzman came out of uh, EC with a surviving magazine called Mad Comics. And right here he talks about, um, you know, he thinks he's responsible as LSD for pr producing the, uh, the protest generation of the 60s. Let me read that again. I think he's talking about Harvey Kurtzman. I think he was responsible as LSD for produ producing the protest generation of the 60s. Matt, Mad Magazine taught kids to question. Mad Magazine, for what it was in the 60s and 70s, is not the Mad Magazine we have today where we have devolved into movie satire, you know, um, television satire and stuff. It, it, I really recommend getting a lot of uh, Mad Magazine, as many as you can get a hold of from the 60s and 70s. I uh, also feel like, Har my opinion is Harvey Kurtzman is just as important as Tolkien, Timothy Leary, the Beatles, everything from there. You, you put Harvey Kurtzman right in there. Um, so he goes on to where he starts talking about 
artists and things that came to America and other things started going all the way back to 1840s sewing slides. And he kind of gets into, that's why I'm saying go back and read this. I'm not going to do it, but you know, there was humor in this stuff. Uh, the Cats and Jammer Kids, newspaper strips, printers coming in. And then what I like here is that saying that um, at the turn of the century, when comic strips were in their infancy in American papers, we come all the way down here to where he starts talking about Joseph Pulitzer. Now, I knew about this, but this is the most um, accurate place that I would actually comment on it. Uh, because Spiegelman just lays it out there. Spiegelman credits Joseph Pulitzer with introducing comics in his new world, uh, New York world, though this wasn't his original intention. Pulitzer was developing a four color press so he could bring fine art to the masses, but his attempts to, attempts to reproduce fine paintings resulted in pure murk. Color comics, on the other hand, looked good in newsprint. It's ironic. So that's what I'm trying to tell you. There was a there's a, just a whole history of how comics even got made. There was a little accidents and things that ended up not working out to where th these things were able to elevate due to lack of, um, um, you know, competition really, you know? Um, so right there, he says it. Spiegelman said comics were a substitute for high art. So basically we have the, the beginnings of what things that will become color comics starting at the lowest tier. They're already a substitute. And then by the time we get to the 80s, with years and decades of people being influenced by the pulps and the things they saw in the newspapers and the serials and the silent movies and the books and, and everything like that, they start, we have the Will Eisners, the Jack Kirby's, the Siegel and Schuster's, the Kubert's. We have all these people jumping up and they're making the rules for storytelling. They're learning and crafting the art. Uh, and when I say rules, I don't mean things like it can be one way or the other. I'm talking about how they develop, how a page can flow, how your, your, they can make the reader, reader's eye follow a story. Um, ways to uh, impact a story through coloring by like having the climax of a single page be com colored completely red. Um, things you don't even think about, how you make, how you control time so a reader doesn't just fly through a comic book, how you pace the story and how you can slow the reader down. Um, so it started, it, it started completely new, like I said, as a substitute for high art, and it took decades for these people to form the art of a comic. And then we had a second generation of people who read comics, of the people who lied about it, how during the 50s, the worst thing in the world you could be was working in comic books thanks to you know, the seduction of the innocent uh, painting. Definitely a black eye in comic book history. But by the time we get to the 70s and 80s, we have people like Marv Wolfman, Frank Miller, um, Alan Moore, people who are fans of the Silver Age stuff, Roy Thomas, who was a fan of the Golden Age. Uh, we have all these people who grew up reading comics and comics in the 60s with Marvel was, you know, was counter counterculture and all these influences they had, and they had no shame being in comics, and they just elevated elevated everything. They, they took everything that the first generation of comic book creators took, and they just have absorbed it, and it blossomed. That's the difference. They were creative. They blossomed. Um, and we go into the first continuing comic character was the Yellow Kid who appeared in 1896. Uh, Lowbrow jokes, minority groups and immigrants, and was favored of the blue collar set. So we get into social classes and stuff. And that's very important because the people who made comics were immigrants and were very poor growing up. They were just looking for a living. So of course, things like that would leak in there. It wasn't so much a statement, it was a reflection of the world they knew. Um, you know, the Yellow Kid is very important here. You can go back and read a lot of this. Little Nemo in Slumberland in 1905. 1905. And uh, that was even, um, given a bit of an homage in Neil Gaiman's uh, The Dreaming um, when he did The uh, Doll's House, um, if you know your comics and stuff. And as you can see right there, uh, sick humor, that was something that was in there with comics. He goes over some of the things like that. Crazy Cat, Dick Tracy, crime. So you see it wasn't always about politics, if you will. Uh, Dick Tracy, I don't mean to fly through here, but I don't want to sit here and make a super long video, but I just wanted to get to the point here. Comic books appeared in the 30s. Uh, 
an enterprising salesman. As you can see, there's like, I don't know, what is that, 50 years of history leading up to the comic of things that built on it. At first, the comic books were reprints from the papers. Basically, uh, Harvey Kurtzman's dad, if I remember, was the person who more or less started folding comic strips in the papers and stuff to figure out uh, a format, which became the comic book that he could sell and put on newsstands. Then fresh material had to be created to meet the demand and to compete with newspapers, and out of that material came Superman and a host of other superheroes, which became the dominant idiom, idiom for the new medium. Um, and then we go, we talk about Will Eisner, the spirit, uh, Mickey Rodent with EC Comics, where we start getting the birth of the underground comics. Uh, Robert Crumb single-handedly was responsible for a lot that happened in the decade. Zap Comics led a, re a re renaissance of cartooning, uh, anger, irreverence, and humor. Artists of the day were liberated because they didn't expect to make a living from their cartoons. And what I didn't know was that there actually is a time. I knew the underground comics started going downhill in the 70s, but I didn't know it was so early as in 1974. Because of the way that I've collected, this is, you know, as I was growing up, uh, going from the late 70s and early 80s, I started knowing about Von Bode, um, Von Bode. And I kind of knew who Crumb was, but, I, you know, his stuff was pretty mature for my little eyes at the time. And this came to Spingleman and I think Crumb. I need to read this. When it comes to the underground stuff, I'm still learning the history of it, uh, which led to a book called Raw, which I think was in 1980. Um, could be wrong there. So we've won the battle to have comics recognized as an art form. Uh, this was in 1990, which is ironic because of the way things are now. Um, you know, a lot of comics have become, I just feel like the, the environment in which you can talk about comics in nowadays, mostly online, uh, a few comic shops that are still surviving if they're out there, not all of them, but a few, I've been around them. Um, you know, has turned into what people thought they were in the 50s. Um, and we have a lot of misinformed people out there talking about things passionately that they don't know a lot about, making statements that are just absurd and asinine. Uh, and then I realized that when we lower it down a little bit and stop talking about a standard, they are, <laughs> they're not even really talking about comics period, uh, is what it comes down to. So the, the thing that really bothers me, uh, which led me to do this, is that I've said it for two or three years, I hate all the credibility that has been lost and forgotten. It's not lost. If, there's, if it's on your bookshelf, if you order these books online, if you get back issues, it's still there. But it's like people have to relearn it if they were really into comics in, as an art form. But a lot of the credibility is gone and replaced with the toxic environment that's out there right now. And I can't believe I'm using a buzzword like toxic, but um, that's the only way to really, really talk about it. Um, comic books is just sort of being hijacked for a culture war, war culture war, and that's kind of sad. Um, it really is. Um, I've got a small channel. I've been doing live streams and a few videos where I brought it back around to just talking comics like you would talk with your friends, talk to people at comic book conventions, talk to people in comic shops the way we did. Um, and I also hate that a lot of this history is out there, but people just don't take the time to look at it. And if they do, they ignore it because it doesn't fit a narrative. Uh, the people who worked in comics, um, Harvey Kurtzman, <coughs> excuse me, Ramona, Ramona Frandon, I, I could come up with all sorts of names, but the biggest thing that came out of comics in the 50s and 60s through EC Comics, Mad Magazine, even with Marvel Comics mostly, like with the Hulk fighting, the, they found a way around the comic book code with the Hulk because he was actually fighting the government, and that's why it was counterculture, was that it taught you to question things, and to question things, you have to break away and think for yourself. And it's quite a journey. It's not the kind of thing where you get an easy answer. You have to take in the big picture. You have to consider, you know, your own faults and assumptions and put them to the side. And uh, it just blows my mind that the, we, we've fallen into hive minds. Um, 
you know, they, they call them echo chambers and stuff. But this is just somebody who has grown up his whole life kind of being contrary, has slowly, um, slowly sort of gotten into the game of what's expected a little bit, uh, just to chilling out with age and stuff um, and calming down. But um, I would really like to see somebody break out, to really break out and uh, be listened to uh, about thinking for yourself, questioning things. Because uh, just because there's two sides doesn't mean either one is right because thinking in absolutes is just not reality. Um, you know, there's always something on each side that you can point out and take out of context and manipulate and things. But anyway, check out this article. In all seriousness, comics as an art form. 1990, look it up through the Chicago Tribune. Um, it's a fascinating read if you're into comics.